and I think I gave him the gun back. And then I stood up and I was just totally drunk, but I was trying to distract them. I'm not sure why. Um, I just wasn't thinking. I, I know that I told them, I'm not sure why I didn't tell them just get out of my apartment now, but I was drunk and they knew that. So whether I consented, I mean, I never really consented to have them there in the first place. And actually I repeatedly said I didn't want them there in the first place. And they persisted and entered my apartment despite my telling them no several times. So once they were in there, I was just acting like a drunk person, I guess. And I got my guitar out and and I serenaded the guys that were had sexually harassed me and told me that they were looking for someone to work for the FBI. So then I sang a song that I had written. And um, they liked the music, I guess. You know, Mexicans. I mean, I have family that's Mexican. Very music, sort of about the heart, singing from the soul type of a thing, and it doesn't even really matter if you sing off key or if you sing very well. If it comes from your heart, then you're likely to get a nod of approval. So, um, sing my song, and then, and then, um. And I had just boxes. At the time, I had boxes and boxes of legal documents. My apartment was filled wall to wall with boxes of documents for my lawsuits. I mean, I had, um, you know, regular sized, huge boxes full of documents. You have no idea how much work those two lawsuits were. I don't know that anybody understands how much work I put into those. Maybe some lawyers do because they probably thought, I think a few of them thought I had a ghostwriter, somebody helping me on the side because I did well enough. But I did a lot of work. And I had a ton of documents. And then the other thing was that I was starting to get harassed by Bullivant House or Bailey, the law firm that was representing the Abbey in Archdiocese. They were sending me documents, not just um, in one form, but they were sending me triplicates. And it was very harassing. Basically, they started, they used the incident where my mailbox was broken into at the apartment complex. And I had, when my mailbox was broken into, one of the, I guess, documents that, I guess one of the lawyers had sent some sort of a motion that I was supposed to get in the mail, and I didn't get it because, um, and I explained it must have come at the time, around the time that my mailbox was broken into. And then the judge just acted like I had made an excuse, like I was lying or that I broke in, and John Camp suggested that I had broken into my own mailbox. I mean, the whole back metal panel was gone from a whole bunch of mailboxes. It had nothing to do with it. But they used that incident as an excuse to then harass me because then they asked permission from the judge to send multiple copies to my house. And they began sending me um, a copy of all their motions to my, to my regular mailbox. Then they sent a second copy through a courier that knocked on my doors at all hours of the night. I mean, all hours of the night. They, and, they would, they, and then they also sent a third copy to my apartment manager. And my apartment manager had nothing to do with my lawsuits. So basically, I became a nuisance. My presence was then a nuisance to my apartment manager and put me on very, very bad terms with the apartment manager, who I previously had no problem with. And so they had these huge documents coming to me from three different directions. 
and with my apartment manager getting upset at me on my end, and a courier knocking at all hours of the day and night on the other end, and and then all of a sudden they just started writing a whole bunch of motions all at once. They just started snowing me with stuff. So um, at that same time that they were doing that, that's when they began frying my fax machines and my printers. And I, they were being jammed. They were being, they were frying. Like I'd buy a brand new one, and I'd have, and it would um, burn up somehow. And I was having to take it to, you know, back to the where I purchased it, buy another one that was brand new, or have it fixed. And then the same thing was happening. So, you know, I was, I was kind of getting slammed. They were trying to do me in, but. I still held my own, and I. That is why, though I had, I had these boxes. I had box after box after box, just in my throughout my entire apartment, of legal documents. I mean, I literally probably had thirty standard-sized boxes, at least thirty, full of paper from legal documents. So, and then I had this very long desk, and I loved my desk. I had a lot of room to work on it. And it was up against my wall with this huge lamp. It's kind of vintage, 70s thing. And um, I had my printer and, and all my, everything set up there. I mean, I could give me a lot of space to work. It was... Um, The desk was as long as like a conference table. It was a regular desk out of like beech wood and kind of a purplish color and top. But um, I had a lot of working space and I remember Raul Buhanda went, looked along the whole edge of that desk and I was kind of wondering why he was looking around like that. So at some point Armando Garza you know, picked up some of the paper that was in one of the boxes and was looking through it. And he's like, what's this? And I, and I said, well, it's my legal documents. And I didn't want to nose in through them. So, um, I also had a file cabinet. I had a couple of file cabinets that I had things organized in. But at any rate, um, then I was really tired. Oh, I, I had a horrible migraine. And I started to get this migraine headache, you know. And this is when I'm think. This is at a time where I th when I thought that my migraines were naturally induced, that I had naturally occurring migraines, and I didn't. And I happened to get a migraine while I was out with the FBI agents, and it was triggered when I was at one of the bars. It was after the being at the first bar with them. And I started to get this horrible migraine. And then they said, I said, do you have any Advil or anything like that? And they said, yes, um, I'm around to do it. And he said, in the car. And I think he got it, or maybe I said, don't worry about it. I can't remember. But I, I don't remember if I took some or not. I'm sure I wrote about it to the FBI when we made my report of the facts of what happened that night. But um, then I still had the migraine headache. And it was really severe. By the time I got to my apartment and I had some Vicodin or prescription something or other, and just a few like in a plastic Ziploc bag, and and I remember I took two of the I took some Advil first. I had taken that and didn't help at all. So then I took a couple of those right you know in front of them because. You know, obviously, like, alcohol doesn't matter how drunk you are, it doesn't do anything for a migraine. And it was just to treat my migraine. It had nothing to do with, later the FBI tried to make it sound like it was some sort of a recreational drug thing. And it had nothing to do with that. It had to do with the fact that I was in a lot of pain, and it's a little strange, actually, now that I think about it. 
that that migraine came up while I was with those two FBI agents. Why should I have had a migraine triggered while I was in their presence? So, you know, and come to find out later, those migraines would have been triggered by military means, not because I have migraines that occur naturally. So this was all occurring while I was there, and I started to get tired after I took the Vicodin. My headache, the migraine did improve, the pain level was better. And then Buhanda said, why don't we go around the corner? And then it was like a sort of a one bedroom studio apartment. I had my bedroom and my bed set up in a, a different side of the room. And so I, so I did, he said, I'll rub your neck or something like that. I can't remember because I had this headache. And, you know, at one point they did say, do you want us to leave the apartment after they kept t groping me and uh, touching my breasts and crotch and thighs. And I kept moving their hands away. And um, I never kissed either one of them or touched them. And... I said, I guess I just let them stay there. So then, but I moved up away from them after, you know, the third time they, they tried something. So, because I thought we were just going to talk, you know, about like the FBI stuff. And, you know, I mean, I was drunk and they were talking about my employment with the FBI, so that was a very natural conclusion for a drunk person to come to, I think. <sighs> and then I went around the corner with Buhanda, and um, and then at one point, too, Garza had his phone with him, and I think he took a photo of me with his cell phone, because he held it up, and I thought he just took a photo of me. I didn't see a flash, but I think he took a photo of me. And then, what, and I also think that Garza was faking sleeping. I thought that he fell asleep on the couch, but I don't think he did. I think he faked it. And then Buhanda said, why don't you come with me, you know, around the corner with, um, I'll help you rub your neck out or something like that. So, we ran around the corner, and I laid down, but... You know, didn't undress at all. I had jeans on and a jeans and sort of a sleeveless shirt and high heels. I took my heels off when I got in the house first. And um, and then he rubbed my neck and and I think he was trying. He maybe once tried to kiss me and I didn't kiss him. Or wouldn't let him kiss me, and I said, no, I don't want to do anything. I said, I'll just give you a back rub and, or whatever. So, for whatever reason, I gave him a back rub. And um, while Garza was in the other room, and then I was falling asleep because of being drowsy from the prescription pills for my migraine. And my head was, you know, and I was tired. So, then all of a sudden, um, what was strange is when I looked up, it, Garza looked like he was in a different shirt than he had come in in, um, 